Hey everyone, it's Joe Glines here in Dallas, Texas. Yeah, and Jack, you're here from Copenhagen, Denmark. And uh, actually, Ryan Wells, I should mention, Ryan was the one that forwarded me this. Let me let me share my screen here. Um, there we go. And uh, he had forwarded me this. It was pretty pretty cool that Windows 10 is going to be allowing Android apps to to run within Windows. Um, now, and Jackie, I think you said you, you looked at this a little bit. Is that right? Yeah, I, I looked at this article because you forwarded it to me as well, and it's interesting. I, I'm, I'm still not fully sure how it will end up working, if it's like uh, some of the other functionality that we have seen with Android. But in this one, they're talking about it being exclusive to Samsung phones. Um, but with um, screen copy, that we've looked at before and, and a few others. There are, there are some commercial ones out there as well uh, that can do this. Um, that will display and let you control your Android device from your Windows phone. And this seems kind of similar in, in idea or look, uh, but it, it sounds as if you wouldn't need to go and download anything. Yeah, that's a great part. Uh, so, so if you can, mm, the other ones we've seen can do it using a cable or over uh, your Wi-Fi, and this sounds as if it can do the same thing. So, as soon as you get home on your network, you would have direct access to your uh, phone from your PC, which could be nice. Uh, they they kind of talk about it at the end of an article that might not interest that many people, but people who don't want to go up and, and go find their phone when they get a notification or whatever it might be. And you can just pull up the phone on your PC screen and handle it. By, by the way, nice. yeah, uh, sorry, interrupt you, Jackie. Um, so it, it, um, it this one, if I remember correctly, works through the app your phone, which is yeah. um, uh, uh, the Windows. Go to the Windows. Um, what's it called? Windows Store. Yeah. And, and then you can connect your phone. So this is um, here. I actually am clicking this, and this these are pictures on my phone that I'm looking at from my computer. I like this one. If you hate your, if you hate yourself, remember you're not alone. A lot of other people hate you too. Um, anyway. Yeah. Uh, I but um, but it, you can. I haven't dabbled with this yet. Apparently, I can make phone calls from my computer through my phone. I think. Yeah. Um, I get the notifications, which um, um, is uh, uh, can be you know crazy. But yeah, um, and and the idea here is, of course, that you can already do all of this in your phone or my phone or whatever your phone. It's a terrible is, name for the app. Yeah, <laughs> it is, but. Um, this next part is that this then should also be able to allow you to run actual applications from your phone, whatever yeah. those might be. Just like when you recently had, what was it, Joe, a map with a car hailing service or whatever it was, a right. park, parking service or what it was. Right. Stuff like that might be nice you will be able to display your stuff on a much larger screen which yep. might be uh, nice for some yeah people. and i was running it through what was the emulator not Knox. yeah um, i think yeah and so it will be really interesting because i know you've tested this a lot more than i have right but with Knox, you could see a little bit of the the window right of how, how do you the, the controls like a couple of things it's not like a Windows control, right? A Windows GUI that you can really get into the nitty gritty and, and manipulate. But you could oh. see a little bit. You showed me that because I, I didn't think yeah. you could, but you, you were able to see a little bit of detail with the GUI. Um, yeah, and I think you would you would end up the same place with this your phone. You there so? will probably be um, a rendered uh, image and and your clicks will be translated into touch points on, on the device. Uh, but 
yeah, that, that's probably it. So, so whatever screen coordinate you click on will be converted into the likewise screen coordinate on your device. And, so and that's probably how it will work. So in other words, this is a flat out lie, right? You can run Android apps on Windows 10, right? Because you're not actually running them. You know, you're showing the GUI, right? Yeah. It's like yeah. the uh, Citrix kind of connection thing. Right? Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, they, we'll they, don't I know get, they don't get that deep into it, but that yeah. would be my belief that you yeah. would get a window with the app running and most likely the resolution that it's running on on your device. Mm -hmm. But who really knows? I'm. Uh, you can do quite a lot of things with code, right? So, <laughs> right. They, they right. might actually be able to somehow bridge um, that, uh, so that the device acts as mm -hmm. I don't know a, a hard drive of some kind and you're actually using your computer's um, resources to run the actual app, that might be possible. So, so that the device is only a storage place. Um, I don't think that's how it's gonna be working, but uh, yeah. that's kind of what the, the top there are saying, you can right. run Android apps on your right. Windows 10 PC, but, you can always already do that with Chrome. Chrome actually allows you to install a plugin and, and run some Android apps on mm -hmm. your Windows 10 PC and Chrome because Chrome actually has a Chrome OS uh, uh, in it. So it can in essence run the app in Chrome OS in Chrome on Windows 10. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not sure how much more different this will be, but it will seem more user friendly. And in, in case any of our viewers, listeners uh, haven't realized why we care, because of course, once you're on Windows, suddenly we can be using auto hotkey for automating whatever we want. Right, and that's that's why I we're so excited. Um, yeah, absolutely, because it is kind of a limiting thing when when stuff only exists on a mobile app or whatever it might be, and you might still want to automate stuff that's going on. And right now, you are limited to all kinds of either some things even need you to root your device or jailbreak your iPhone or whatever it might be, and most people don't want to do that. They, it might not mean that much, but for me at work, if I were to automate something on my phone, I wouldn't be allowed to do any of those things because it's a managed device with a certificate for my work. So if I were to do any of those things, that would be void. So I'm not allowed to do that. And, thereby I'm kind of limited in how I can do stuff. So something like this where you just plug and play and you don't need extra permissions and all kinds of stuff, that, that's helpful. Yeah, and in some of the other one, well, the one that we discussed the other day, just you and I were off, offline, we were chatting about it, but if I remember right, it was, um, it's basically like interacting as like a Bluetooth thing. Isn't that what it was? Like it, it, it's pretending like you connected an external keyboard and mouse or something like that. Is that right? And that was something else we talked about. I'm not sure if it's, this technology here will be using any of that. Um, the thing we were talking about was with, with iPhones and, and uh, Android phones now allowing you to connect a, a Bluetooth um, controller or Bluetooth external keyboard or Bluetooth mouth, mouse. Some already allowed you to do it, but not all of them. And now it's from what I read, both uh, iPhone and, and Apple, uh, iPhone and Apple, both uh, Android and, and iOS 
should allow for that uh, in most recent versions. So some people have made programs that utilize that. So you can already today control most devices from your Windows 10 PC. Um, but again, some of them then need either root or jailbreaking and the newest versions of them use this um, Bluetooth um, device. Um, it's not because they're faking it, they're just sending or acting as if it was uh, being sent from a separate Bluetooth device. By the way, yes, uh, yesterday or I was working on on something with my network. I have a uh, you know uh, I have Ethernet on this computer, so that's how I normally connect to it. But in my room, it's really far from my router. You know, I didn't realize like in Windows 10, there's this you know some you can have this button here and actually create you know with your computer create a hotspot um, sending out the Wi-Fi signal. So I thought that was yeah, pretty cool. yeah, it's it's nice. Both that you can do it on Windows 10 and also that you can do it with your mobile devices in most cases. Um, yeah, I can't with mine, unfortunately. <laughs> they're, they're, um, I have unlimited data. And so unlimited data, they, I guess they say, well, we don't want them actually using it for a lot of stuff, so, which makes no sense. But uh, you know, they, they don't allow me to create a hotspot, so it's really frustrating. Yeah, uh, here in Denmark, maybe three, three years ago or something, uh, a new mobile company started and, and their biggest sales point was that you got unlimited everything for uh, a, a good price, um, something like $50 or something a month, right? And uh, the only thing that was there was if you wanted to share the internet connection, the data, you could only share 50 gigabytes a month oh, of it. So, yeah. so you could still, as as a youth or, or something on a weekend or whatever, you could create a hotspot and, and in a jam, give other people uh, some data, but uh, still with a limit as one of the only things that were really limited. Yeah. So, um, but anyway, the reason why I thought of the other one was just the, uh, the, the Bluetooth slash, you know, Wi-Fi connecting to things, because of course we can automate, you know, that kind of stuff. And this one, they're both in some ways just allowing you to uh, uh, use Windows, right? To connect to other things that you wouldn't normally think we'd be running. Well, and we're not running auto hot on it. Who, do you remember who, was it Sean, I think, mentioned that he was running auto hot key on Linux in the webinar? Yeah, I think that was, might have been Sean, yeah. And it was one of those also, he was just running Linux like in a shell kind of thing, right? And he's sending keystrokes to Linux, which still, hey, it's great, you know, it works, but. Yeah, it, he he installed a, a Linux shell or might not even have been the shell, but uh, at least he was running Linux in a window on Windows. Right. So uh, in essence, he had a Linux prompt that he could do stuff in, uh, but then he still had our hotkey running in Windows. And if you did simple enough stuff, like uh, hot strings, hotkeys and stuff like that, Windows were still registering all of those things before they went to the Linux window. So in essence, he had our hotkey on Linux, but he wasn't really running our hotkey on Linux. But yeah, in in Linux, how's that? Oh, yeah, yeah. in Linux. <laughs> However, yeah. Um, yeah. but you know, and I guess now I hadn't thought about it the other day. But you know, looking at those three examples we just gave, it gets back to which which you and I both right are notorious for not condemning and not shaming, but discouraging to for the most part sending keystrokes, right? However. Um, I think you and I'll be, you know, if that's the option and we can do those things and we have that requirement, by all means, right? I'll, I'll do that to automate something if I have to. Um, so it is great. Auto Hotkey can easily send keystrokes and mouse clicks and, you know, make it look like you're actually using the computer when you're not. Yeah, for the user, 
and and one of the things that you can see it on is the popularity of uh, the fine text library mm -hmm. the, the name is is weird but the functionality is like your automate my task and then those others where you are combining the ability to find pixel patterns um, with specific actions that you want to take when you find them, which is a common use for auto hotkey in all kinds of cases. But as we have pushed for at least a few years that you should look for that deeper anchor mm -hmm. when possible, where you can actually know that you're putting the cursor in a specific field or that you're focusing or grabbing the, um, the value from a specific place. But you can get close by trying to do what the human eye does. And that is determine patterns on screen and pulling data from that. Because we're not connected to the computer. So, so yeah. it's one of the things, yeah. It's one of the things that I know Elon Musk uh, used quite a, um, a bit of um, talk time recently, or recently, maybe a year or two ago, I don't know, um, on talking about that the issue with people and computers is that people are now the, the slow part. Computers now and in the future are so much faster than us that we're simply slowing down all of the things that it does because it takes too much time for us to get the data and input it back just because we need to visually interpret what's going on and that takes about 80 milliseconds or something for our brains to even determine what we're seeing and and then upwards of 300 milliseconds for us to actually take an action so you have almost 500 milliseconds in that loop when you include the human and and for a computer that that's really really slow when yeah i, I forget the the movie it was a star trek movie where data he got some like real skin and uh i forget what the movie anyway the, the near the end of it Captain Picard's talking to him and says, you know, uh, were you ever really tempted? And Data says, well, for 0. 0.000 blah, 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 you know, milliseconds, I was tempted. But for me, that was an eternity. Yeah. <laughs> so it, was, it, was, it was awesome. But it's like, yeah, for a computer, you know, that, that yeah. I, I, I want to find that, that what you're talking about, because I think that's a really, really good point of human, remember humans are the slow part now. And the more we can remove humans, you know, any interaction, because the stuff you were just describing was probably for like race car drivers when they're paying attention every second, right? It's, it's the most optimal. And of course, humans get distracted and we never work at that speed. Um, so I, I'd love to, to take a look for that and see. Uh, I, I bet there's some really good stuff there that we could help encourage businesses to really think about removing humans from, you know, the actual transaction, right? The thinking part still will make a decision, but the processing of the, the you know, act, uh, the process, um, yeah. don't have a human doing that. No, I, I, the only one I truly remember is um, the 80 milliseconds mm. for, our, for our brain to determine shapes from visual input. So the reason that people can jump because a stick is underground when they didn't expect it is because it has the shape of a snake. And our brain will act before we have fully interpreted the, the screen as a safety mechanism. Just like when people, they start their uh, fight or flight uh, response when something big jumps out around the corner or whatever it might be. And that's, that's the same thing. So that is truly our capacity to determine what we see. We can't do it quicker than that. And for a computer to have to use 80 milliseconds on something, when, when you take into account that 
if you wanted to do something every frame um, of just this video here, I'm not sure what video amount of uh, people are running, but uh, at one point it was about between 26 and 30 images a second. So that's about uh, 30 milliseconds an image. So the computer is able to do quite a lot with 30 milliseconds. And we can't even see <laughs> that they're there. So, right. yeah. Um, well, you know, and, and Jackie, I'm not sure, I guess we would have to design a test to, uh, let's say we had a project we wanted to do um, uh, in Excel and we wanted to copy a cell uh, in one cell and paste it to another and do that 500 times, right? Um, and we could do that test and optimize it the best we could with sending keystrokes and then we could do the best we could with calm and see what that speed difference was, right? I think that would be a fun little experiment to see uh, even when you're using a computer to do the, the keystroke, like where you are and, and check the cell to make sure you're in the right cell kind of thing. Um, it, uh, it, it's going to be significantly slower than using calm, right? Yeah, sure. Just, just some of the moving of data would be just uh, have a, a bit of overheat to it. But yeah, it, it would be marginally um, slower, but it would be slower. And for everything you did, you would add to, to that. And again, we're not trying to beat up sending keystrokes. It's just, if you have another way, um, you know, use the other way. Anytime you're doing something and you have coordinates involved, um, that's probably, you know, not a very robust approach compared to if you have another approach that doesn't require that. Yeah. Awesome. All right, well, let's go ahead and, unless you've got something else to wrap this up. No, it's, it's fine. Awesome. All right, man, keep talking. Yeah, absolutely, Joe. Yeah. Bye.